thanks to everyone joining us. We'll get started in just a few moments. Thank you for the reminder. We have enabled automatic closed captioning and we have our ASL interpreters with us today. Thank you all so much for joining us. I wanna hand off the mic to our very own Kellen Baker, who is, will share his opening remarks. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Welcome friends and all of our guests who have taken the time to be with us today. We are thrilled to have you. Uh, I am Kellen Baker. I'm the executive director of the Whitman Walker Institute. And the mission of the Whitman Walker Institute is to strategically leverage research, education, and policy to support Whitman Walker's efforts to improve the health and well-being of underserved communities, particularly LGBTQI plus people and people living with HIV. Whitman Walker is a federally qualified community health center that was built on the belief that LGBTQ people deserve better than shame and disbelief from our medical providers. In our almost 50 years of practice, we've learned a great deal about how to care for each other in a way that affirms each person's inherent dignity and protects the health of our patients and communities. We also have a responsibility both to provide the highest quality affirming care to the patients who come through our doors and to provide resources to others in DC and nationwide to help ensure that all people can receive the best care free from discrimination and judgment. The Transforming Healthcare Online Toolkit builds on years of collaboration between clinicians, advocates, researchers, and other experts in our community of practice. These folks, many of whom have joined us here today, are working in organizations and institutions across the nation who share our vision for a better healthcare system for all. This exciting new resource provides tools for interrogating and challenging the status quo. Building equity in our healthcare system is a process of collaborative engagement, a small piece of which we see in the collaborative effort that has gone into creating this resource. This project is designed to continue to change and grow as more people give their input. So if you'd like, please take a spin by WhitmanWalkerImpact.org and check out the resource and drop your two cents into the suggestion box for what you would like to see as this toolkit continues to grow and evolve. Another way you can contribute is to use the question feature of our Zoom webinar to begin to ask questions of our panelists. Our panelists this afternoon will be moderated by Dee McGreeny, Whitman Walker's Director of External Training. As a former staff member of the Les Lesbian Services Program of Whitman Walker Clinic, and the Montner Project for Lesbians with Cancer, Dee has been an educator and innovator in cultural competency trainings for lesbian health with a commitment and focus on improving health outcomes for all sexual minority women. Dee will be in conversation with a fabulous group of panelists who we are so honored and thrilled that they have joined us today. She will be speaking with Dr. Aletha Maybank, MD, MPH, the Senior Vice President and Chief Health Equity Officer of the American Medical Association, Dr. Asa Radix, who has far too many degrees for me to read out, Senior Director of Research and Education at the Callan Lord Community Health Center, an Assistant Professor of Epidemiology at Columbia University, and a Fellow at the Research Education Institute for Diverse Scholars. The third panelist will be Dr. David Nalbranch, a physician, researcher, author, educator, and public health advocate who specializes in HIV AIDS prevention and treatment. Again, I cannot emphasize how honored and excited we are that these panelists have joined us today to walk through this toolkit and talk about the ways in which cultural competency training is an essential component of providing the highest quality healthcare to all people anywhere across the United States. 
For now, I want to pass the microphone to our colleagues and movement catalysts, Daniel Bruner and Liz Margulies, who will tell us a little bit about themselves, their work on this project, uh, and how this project got started. So Dan and Liz, take it away. Thank you all again for joining us. Hi, can you see me? Um, hi, um, this is really exciting. Today is the culmination of hard work by many people over several years, and I couldn't be more proud of what we've done. This process began in 2017 at a GLMA conference where I was leading a workshop with doctors Asa Radix and Shail Mangi called How to Move LGBT Health Forward When You Don't Have the Data. And we presented the process of creating a white paper on LGBTQ people with cancer. We then broke up into small groups and I led my group to talk about how we could do a similar process looking at cultural competence training because there's a growing availability of trainings and trainers and curricula, but there are no, or at that time, there were no generally agreed upon standards or recommendations or even measures of success. At the end of the workshop, Dan came up to me. I had only met him that day and he said, this is a great idea. Let's really do it. And by 2018, we met, our first summit met in Washington DC at Whitman Walker Health. And in attendance were colleagues and stakeholders that we invited from across the country, trying to be as inclusive as possible. And together over the course of a long weekend, we produced some preliminary recommendations and standards. We then sent these out for a wide community review and then met again a second time in 2019 to fine tune the standards and recommendations and discuss what the format should be to have this have the greatest impact and um, accessibility as possible. Um, if Ben, you could show the slide, I want to just show everybody the amazing group of people who worked on this project to make this happen. And you'll see, um, the slide is coming, and you'll see that we have people from Fenway, Mount Sinai, University of Chicago, Callan Lord, University of Pittsburgh, uh, UCSF Center for Excellence in Transgender Health. Take a minute and look at this group of hardworking people because together, collaboratively, we have created these standards and recommendations that we're launching today. Dan? Thanks, Liz. Um, I'm really honored to have been working with Liz on this project for more than four years, along with the other distinguished summit participants whose uh, names you just saw. And I'm really thrilled to see the project come to fruition uh, today. Uh, this really is a collective product uh, and we're deeply appreciative of the many folks who've lent their expertise to these guidelines. And I urge you to read more about them all in the toolkits appendix. Um, as a lawyer, I've worked on discrimination you know, issues and litigated discrimination cases for many years and clear discrimination laws and robust enforcement of those laws are of course critical. And I think we're making major progress nowadays, but we all know that there are significant barriers to healthcare for sexual and gender minority folks beyond things that are legally actionable discrimination, lack of provider knowledge, provider biases, lack of familiarity with queer people, lack of comfort talking with queer people, signal to so many patients that they aren't understood and they aren't welcome. So too many people avoid routine medical care. As a result, they miss opportunities for early diagnosis of emergent problems, and they miss opportunities to better understand their health and understand ways to protect it. And then when queer people do see a doctor, too often providers don't know what questions to ask 
or how to really talk to them. So the providers miss opportunities to get the information they need to make critical diagnoses. So training in cultural as well as clinical competency is essential for all health professions and all healthcare staff. And we're hopeful that this toolkit will significantly contribute to this goal. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Admiral Rachel Levine, Assistant Secretary for Health at the US Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Admiral Levine is a physician who, with specialties in pediatrics and adolescent medicine. She's been a professor of medicine and served as physician general and secretary of health in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. As Pennsylvania's top public health official, she worked to address the opioid epidemic to improve maternal and adolescent health and of course, to address the COVID pandemic. Uh, she's an expert in LGBTQ health issues, and she's the first openly transgender person to be nominated by a president and approved by the Senate, and also the first openly transgender admiral in the commissioned public health service. Uh, Admiral Levine has led the administration's COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, and she's a leader on health equity and LGBTQI health issues. We're really honored that she's agreed to participate in our event today. So let's now hear Admiral Levine's remarks. Good afternoon. And thank you, Daniel and Liz, for that very kind introduction. It has been an exciting time for me, and I hope that my appointment symbolizes progress for LGBTQI plus individuals. I am so pleased to serve in this role for the impact that I can make and for the historic nature of what it symbolizes. May this appointment be the first of many like it as we create a more inclusive future. Now I stand on the shoulders of those who came before, people we know throughout history and those whose names we may never know because they were forced to live and work in the shadows. Now we have all faced a very and difficult and challenging time. COVID-19 has been taxing physically and mentally, especially among our country's most vulnerable populations, and we've all felt the strain. One important lesson of the pandemic is that we are all interconnected and we need to ensure that a healthier future includes eliminating health disparities and promoting health equity. Despite the heavy toll it has exacted, COVID has also reminded us of a fundamental truth that we need each other, that our happiness and our very survival depends on our connection to one another and to our community. That spirit of community, including the community at Whitman Walker and across the nation, that's what makes this work possible. It's what makes our country great. And it's now what we need more than ever. Another important lesson is the profound importance of public health. Now I take time in every presentation to encourage everyone in the audience to get your COVID-19 vaccine. And if you haven't already done so, get your booster. And I want to encourage you to help others in your community and at your institutions to get vaccinated as well. The more people that are vaccinated and boosted, the quicker we can put this pandemic behind us. Now, the fact is that this pandemic has affected some communities far more than others. And this underscores the profound disparities in health that have plagued our nation for far too long. While we work to tackle the pandemic, we will also not take our foot off the gas when it comes to improving health equity and promoting diversity. I would like to highlight the importance of diversity. Diversity for a university, a medical center, a business, and government, really in every organization. I strongly feel that diversity in all of its myriad and wonderful aspects should be welcomed and actually celebrated for the way that it strengthens and enhances any organization. 
I encourage you all to embrace and emphasize diversity. And I commend the work of Whitman Walker, the National LGBT Cancer Network, and the other institutions that have partnered with them to create this important guidance and resource to promote cultural transformation at every level of healthcare delivery. I look forward to seeing how their work to support training and education in LGBTQI plus cultural competency and humility equips those in our healthcare system with the skills to recognize and embrace diversity and helps us all to advance equity wherever we can. The Biden-Harris administration is working to advance equity for communities who have been underserved by the federal government, and that includes my work at the Department of Health and Human Services. We know that there are many groups that face unique and increased risks. We must close disparities in access and outcomes, eliminate bias and discrimination, and address the systemic barriers, including systemic racism, that have contributed to historic inequities. All Americans deserve services that are timely, affordable, accessible, equitable, and high quality. These are our family members, our friends, our neighbors, our patients, providers, co-workers. As a nation, we can and we must do better. I also urge you not to forget to take care of your own mental and physical health during these very challenging times, a valuable lesson that everyone needs to remember. Take time to care for yourself, too. I hope this leaves you with a sense of hope for a better and healthier future. I am a positive and optimistic person, and I believe that we can and we will work together to come out of this stronger and build a better future for our nation's health. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Levine. Hello, everyone. My name is Benjamin Brooks, and I am the Associate Director of Policy and Education with Whitman Walker Institute. I'm also your webinar presenter today, your sort of behind the scenes guy. I use he him pronouns, and I'm going to take the opportunity here in the next few minutes to share with you Good afternoon. some of the faces and the names of the folks who contributed to this project. This is a, an effort. Uh, these are the photos of the 2018 percent of participants. This is a collaborative effort from organizations around the nation and their generosity of time and energy and expertise are what have made this possible. These are some of the faces from our 2018 summit participants, sorry, 2019 summit participants. The next few slides, I want to share with you some of the images and details of our online resources to help to orient you to how it can be used and accessed. The toolkit has a menu that shows up on the left hand side of the screen by pressing this block of 12 button uh, dots here at the top, which shows the table of contents. We have tried in the toolkit to use images and graphics that help to emphasize the importance and the, um, the, the emphasis on certain elements. One of the most exciting pieces of the toolkit for me is that we have a glossary that is fully integrated throughout the text and the examples that were donated by the various organizations that are linked also throughout the text. This is a really robust tool that will give folks the tools that they need wherever they are in their career as a trainer to access supports for LGBTQIA plus cultural competency, cultural competency trainings. Here's another few examples of some of the sections of our toolkit. We have, um, we tried to create a practical and accessible experience out of 100 pages of text. Um, it's a really beautiful job done by our web design team here at Women Walker led by Jay Lautner, our external affairs and brand manager. With that, I want to share in the chat with you, if you'll give me a second, I'm going to send the link to the toolkit with to all of you so you can take a moment to explore it if I can find the chat as I am. Here it is. 
uh, um, it's boring here. Here you are. And then finally, I want to take a sec a moment to share uh, a short video from Whitman Walker that displays the aspiration that we have to be a culturally competent um, place for our patients. So I, this is just a short 60 second clip. Oh, let's try that again. When I walk into the doors of Whitman Walker, I automatically feel calm. I feel centered. There's balance. When you walk into Whitman Walker Health, you matter. Whitman Walker makes me feel like a person, a human being. They take everyone individually and focus on just me, my needs, my problems, my situation. Whitman Walker makes me feel healthy and happy. A place for me to actually start to branch out start to get comfortable with myself and start to actually meet other people. It's a non-judgment facility. You come in, you don't get judged. You come in to get assistance, and that's what we're here for. And with that, I will pass it off to our distinguished panelist and Dee McGreeny. All right. Okay, there I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Benjamin, it's really not fair to leave with that video. It, I, I see that video every few weeks and it still really touches my heart in that um, that is, I think, the core of that message is what we're all working for is um, the ability to provide care that feels like care. I don't want you to feel ill or ill at ease when you come for care, when you're thinking about accessing care. That, that is a barrier all in itself. So my name is Dee Magrini and I have the honor to sit with these wonderful people this afternoon and ask questions. That's a, that's a great benefit to me. So thank you all for being here. And this is the first time I've gotten to look at the toolkit as a whole. And my question for all of you today um, is how do you think this resource is really going to work in terms of transforming how people see healthcare, how are we going to encourage them to see whole people in their work through this resource? I turn it to the group. David, I'll start with you. There you go. <laughs> Why did I know you were gonna put me on the spot? Um, <laughs> well, first of all, let me just say what an honor it is. And I want to thank uh, Benjamin and Whitman Walker for inviting me into this space today. I was a, a little bit late jumping on board. I was actually interviewing um, and had to drive through some traffic to get here, but I'm just very thankful to be here. But I think, you know, the toolkit is one of those things where, you know, if you look at that, and I'm an old school head you know, 1990s r and all that kind of good stuff where we used to say FUBU for us, by us. I think it is one of those things where you have to look at ourselves for the answers to this. So it gets kind of tiresome. And I know uh, yourself and uh, the, the co-panelists who are on here as well will talk about, you know, a lot of times when we work in these clinic spaces, we are charged with the one to be the one that has to take care of the patient who comes from a diverse sexual orientation background or a diverse gender identity and the goal in all of this, I think, with the toolkit is to make sure that all providers are actually meeting that standard of care. And so, you know, there's some people that would like to cherry pick and say, well, you know, they know their bias inside. And so they choose not to take care of certain patients that may not look like them or may not act like them, may not love like them. And I think this is a toolkit to let people know, like, hey, we have the resources and we can give you some education so that you too can kind of take care of any patient and feel comfortable doing so no matter where they come from um, and who they love and who they are. I think it's one of those things where because it comes 
from a diverse group that's representing a lot of different races, ethnicities, sexual orientations, and gender identities. Then um, things like CC whole competency, cultural humility. This will be a toolkit for us by us that allows other healthcare providers to live up to those standards that they need to be uh, holding themselves accountable to. And I'll turn it over to Asa. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Help okay. me out. There you go. No, I mean, thank you. Thank you so much. I also want to say that, um, you know, uh, well, thank you for inviting me to, to be on this panel. And I was certainly fortunate enough to be uh, involved in the, you know, in the creation of this document, um, you know, as a participant. So, I mean, you know, we can, we can, um, think big, I think, with this document, right? I mean, I, I'm a healthcare provider, and as a healthcare provider, I do want to make sure that everyone is engaging in healthcare, right? And that it's this is within an infrastructure that's free of the systems and structures that perpetuate uh, inequities. And, and again, this, this is not just, I shouldn't say just, but, you know, in addition to uh, folks who are LGBTQ identified, you know, these isms are also on the basis of race, ethnicity, age, you know, where we live, um, social class, um, and, men, you know, the many identities that, that people can hold. And I, what I love about this resource, um, in addition, um, as David said, you know, improving how clinicians are going to be interacting with folks, um, who we know face, you know, many barriers when accessing and receiving medical care. But I think the issue is really about uh, cultural humility, which is what this uh, document is uh, trying to do, um, can be applied to so many different aspects of people's identities. Um, and as we look through the resource, um, you know, one of the areas that's talked about a lot is um, this idea of transformational learning. So not just providing people with the knowledge and skills, which we know, you know, can be forgotten or can be outdated, but also, you know, changing these uh, assumptions um, that people have. So uh, changing attitudes, which um, hopefully will be long lasting. Um, the other thing about this resource is, isn't just about individual change, it's about um, you know, bigger change, systems change. Uh, they talk about, um, you know, like a ripple effect, not just how providers work, but how uh, departments that the providers are in, how those change, how, how whole institutions can change. And, you know, hopefully how societies can change because this bar is raised and that ultimately we will be, um, you know, impacting all the people, um, and, and systems uh, that we work with. So uh, hopefully that's an answer. I, I do believe this goes well beyond LGBTQ people. I, I guess I'm left here. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, good to be in conversation, uh, both with Isa and uh, David, and um, just good to be in the space with everyone. You know, from <clears throat> my perspective and you know, being at um, the AMA, there's lately, it actually over the last few years, especially, lots of reach out, you know, from folks on like, what do we do? How do we do this? There's not enough information out there. And then I do see information that's out there that sometimes, as we all know, has been created, and to your point, David, not by us or by people who have really been experiencing the injustice. And a lot of folks are coming into this space that really don't belong in this space. So I think the value and the power of this, as was already said, is that it does center the voices and the experiences and the ideas and the thought and the expertise of those who have experienced the injustice, live the injustice, but also live the joy of the community as well. And so I think that that is absolutely critical to center and always elevate and also to kind of demonstrate as an example to institutions, other institutions, that this can be done. So this is meaningful for the space right now, but this is also a demonstration and an example of how to do things, how to create and engage guys, I mean, guides in within, um, how to, sorry, how to center people within the space of creating these kind of guides and toolkits that we do as institutions. The other real value that I saw just skimming through it just now quickly as well is the intersectional piece to it. Um, that, 
you know, we don't see often either, you know, usually it's segregating racial equity and um, LGBTQ plus equity. And so the fact that it's kind of entered and centered, I think in this, this um, guide is also extremely helpful um, as well. And then lastly, I'll just say, you know, I have my, my feelings about cultural competency. And I think we all understand that, you know, it's not just about how we become competent and, and really the possibility or maybe not the possibility of being that, as was already mentioned, the context of humility, but I think it's also the context of safety that we have to elevate, um, and especially in times like this, um, when we see increasing even more so than before, um, you know, intentional harm that is coming from all aspects of society um, upon us as physicians and healthcare providers, as well as our patients. And so I think this guide also provides and toolkit provides this opportunity around really elevating the importance of safety uh, for all of us. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, that really brings, uh, it's a little further on my, down on my list of questions, but I, I think Dr. Maybank really touched that for me, is in these rooms where these trainings are delivered, where this resource guide will be applied, there's generally a trainer or someone helping folks along in this process. The room has the room to maintain some integrity, some safety generally. What, what's your vision for maintaining safety for the trainers, for the folks delivering this information? How do you sustain yourselves after several hours of going through this material and, and maybe touching nerves that you have? This, this is our life. I'll let you all address it as you will, yeah. You mean as far as our, our, our own safety, like our own self-care about doing this or, you know, physical harm in these spaces or just how draining this is to kind of do this or all of the above? We can take all of the above, but really <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking about personal, just personal integrity. How do we leave the room and leave what's in the room there and, and come home feeling whole? Yeah, I mean, I think the toolkit helps with that. And I, I think it, it's safe to say that a lot of us are doing this work already every day, um, but it just hasn't been formalized in this format. And I think what's nice is that, you know, this gives us a, a formal toolkit um, with some very kind of structured tenets and aspects of it to bring people into these spaces. And I mean, let's be clear, there are some spaces where, you know, they're checking off a box with the, you know, the DEI curriculum and the audience that you're going to be presenting to is not going to be receptive. And that can be very toxic and draining as you're trying to do this and you're gonna hear people making snide comments. Um, and other groups will be absolutely receptive and ask questions from a legitimate and kind of curious space. And I think what we have to do is, is remember, I think the, the best example I can give of this is kind of, the grace that we try to extend people like, for instance, if someone who is uh, trans and confirming their transgender identity and they're letting their family members know and the family members have known this family member, love this family member as the gender that they were assigned at birth. And so it's a transition for the family members to actually kind of get to that space. Meanwhile, the individual that's going through that is like, I've been dealing with this this whole time. And I've heard from a lot of family members tell me from patients of mine and also friends of mine who've gone through that transition and the gender confirmation that the hardest part of it was actually forgiving their families. And the families would express, well, hey, I know they've been dealing with this, but this is new to me and you gotta give me time. And in some spaces, it's kind of narcissistic where it's all about them and you're not thinking about what this loved one has gone through. But I think part of the process is us getting to a space where we actually forgive people for not being where they should be at a certain time and giving them time to understand that. Even with all of us, our understanding of our own individual sexual identities, our attractions, our gender identities is a very fluid and long process. It's not that kind of magical popping out of a cake and saying, I'm out of the closet um, doing those things. That's not how it works. It's kind of more of a, a continuum of a journey. And I think we have to realize that the audiences that we speak to may be on that same journey. And so it may require a lot more of our effort, a lot more of our understanding, a lot more of our uh, tolerance and patience 
of where people are and that may drain us so we have to make sure we have the resources when we go back whether it be through family or friends through spirituality medication hanging out with colleagues doing something that's constructive um, and positive and affirming for us because sometimes having to deliver that information and train people can be very exhausting both physically and spiritually Asa, would you like to take a stab at the question? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I agree with everything that uh, that David is saying. You know, um, as far as how the this particular resource can help, um, you know, there's one place, and I'm sure um, we'll probably go through the the you know the the toolkit a little bit later in in more detail. But um, there's one place where it talks about um, how, how to approach the trainings, um, like what you need to do before you go into the space. And, and I think that's, you know, it's not only important for understanding, you know, what the agency or institution is like, and, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the types of, of questions that they have and providing the appropriate training. I mean, it's also important from uh, for a safety aspect, right? Um, because you certainly don't want to, I mean, I believe in um, patience and forgiveness and all of these things, but I'm certainly not going to put myself in a situation that's dangerous. And I don't think anyone else should, should either. But the toolkit actually um, talks about um, assessing environments, you know, uh, tools that trainers can use. Um, they can include things like, um, you know, who asked for the training? Um, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? Is it is it just a checkbox to say that they've they've done it, or are they are they truly interested? You know, what is the um, you know what are the relationships they have with LGBTQ people within their own organization? Um, do they have uh, do they actually have plans to change their environments um you know it's it really is an opportunity to go a lot further and really think about the challenges that organizations face and get a get a sense of you know are you just there again to check that box um is it a safe environment for you to go into um you know we do provide um lots of links and when we had a lot of discussion around how to um, how to take care of ourselves when we're when we're doing this work because as you said it um, it can be very very difficult and I could just um, add into that and kind of build on both what what David and Asa said is that you know when I was at New York City Department of Health and doing this work it's one of my biggest learning lessons um, that I experienced um, and, and one of the things that I feel actually I did not do well was providing and ensuring that kind of safety that is needed. And that's why I really always elevated it because, you know, a lot of times in doing this work, people do focus on the training. Um, and I'm not saying the training has been optimal, but they'll focus on the training, they'll focus on the technical pieces of doing the work without realizing that if we're really trying to shift culture, then we have to focus on these other kind of what I say, the heart pieces of the work, right? The emotions, the the the, the social pieces of this work that really drive change, um, I think, in an institution. And if we don't focus on that and focus on really the realities of trauma historically within the institution, trauma for the individuals, trauma for their experience within society, um, the ability for trauma to actually um, elevate and create, it create new trauma, truthfully, in doing this work, then we're missing a big part of the importance and, and the need for doing this work in the first place is about affirming our own humanity and our community's humanity. And so we need to be very intentional um, when we start to do training programs and training our staff, or if we have staff that are trainers, to be very explicit about naming the importance of having trauma-informed supports, whatever we wanna name it. You can use whatever terms you wanna use, but the, the importance of making sure that we have spaces with psychological safety, and that there are processes and practices to do so. And so part of that is also creating space, making sure that we are having space to have these conversations because we take that for granted as well. Um, not just for, you know, again, the technical pieces of our work for quality improvement, et cetera, 
but what is happening with us? What's the experience of our staff and our trainers? And you know, how can we help support them move through those points of tension are really critical. And quite frankly, like we don't, I don't have the expertise to do that. So then we have to think about, so what are the investments that we make as institutions to bring that expertise on board oftentimes that, that, that actually has the skill set to help support our staff and our trainers to move through these processes and to support us as leaders in how we do this work um, around, um, you know, providing psychological safety and safe spaces for those who are training and doing equity work within an institution. And I think the guide is really a great um, starting point for setting that foundation that as, a, as already has been mentioned as well. And if I could, I, you know, as moderator, it's, it's, it's hard to, to listen and not add to, but I think in this, in this, at this point, I would like to just say that I had to learn um, that self-safety, that self-protective thing on my own. There were, at least I was not connected with a lot of folks that were doing this work when I began. And so some of it was hit and miss, but really um, what I had to go back to was how do I know how to communicate? And for me, the heart piece that you mentioned, Dr. Maybank, was, was really important and remains really important in terms of the work I do. It is about grounding myself in a real story, in a real way. I'm, I'm in here and I'm trying to save my life and other people's lives. This yeah. is real. And I try to help the group of people I'm working with feel that. I'm working with you. I'm not here to diminish you. I'm not here to punish you. I'm not here to do any of those things. I'm here so we can all walk together. And for me, um, that seems to be a fairly successful way to enter into the conversation. We might not stay right there, but it, it, it's at least a way um, to establish humanity in the room, that initial piece. I would just like that. I 100% I agree with that. I think the way we show up as ourselves, um, you know, to be as authentic, and it's hard for in certain settings because there, there are quote unquote, you know, real and perceived risks for being able to do that, you know, and how we show up um, in our sense of authenticity. And again, in that heart space is really important. You know, for me recently, I've been really challenged in terms of thinking about personal safety. And we're, we're hearing lots of attacks happening against physicians and, and providers just in general. Um, and, you know, I've, we released the guide, just thinking about toolkits and guides released a, a few months ago, and I've been getting death threats. And so it, it changes the, <laughs> like, you know, the kind of the work and the opportunity for myself um, and what I have to think about. And I would say, who have I relied on? And, and David brought this up earlier, has, has been really my close network. My other you know, colleagues who are doing this work, and I think it's really important for us to nurture those spaces for ourselves outside of the workplace um, with our, our friends or our colleagues who may be experiencing the same thing, learn a few lessons, but also just get love, you know, and, and be able to cry and to laugh and to, to, to do all those things that are fully human. Um, around this work and to, to have that comfort to show up in that space. And I think even in, in situations like this, to be able to say it and name it, because folks are like, why are you telling people that? I'm, I'm telling people that because this is the work. This is, this is what it is. And I think we have to you know, create space and, and have safety to be able to talk about that as well. Thank you for that. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah. And so I wonder how do we, as, as we move, we have this toolkit, we have these resources, how do we talk to and how do we support new folks that want to do this work? Not, not tangentially, like I'm the trainer here, so I'm going to learn these curriculum and I'm going to deliver this, but folks that want to focus on LGBTQ health and equity around that, how do we support them? How do we help identify them? and uh, get them going. Any of you are welcome. Dee, I was gonna suggest, I saw a couple of uh, questions in the chat. Did you wanna address those? Um, Cause I think they have specific implications and I don't know, I, I have some thoughts but I don't know whether Asa would wanna take a first uh, stab at this and let us know cause someone mentioned as a, a black ovarian cancer patient 
advocate looking to bring the issues of black transgender patients diagnosed with gynecological cancers to the table? Do we have concrete, concrete strategies to engage this population? And then someone also chimed in about the needs for, uh, Nicholas chimed in, the needs of trans women with prostate cancer fall into the same basket. So, you know, I think those are two very important questions. I can, I can speak, I don't know whether there's enough information or enough infrastructure, uh, obviously nationally, but even locally at some of our places, because it, it tends to be that a lot, of, um, a lot of the clinics I've worked in, even the ones that give amazing gender care, sometimes fall a little bit short of doing the proper screening, being attentive to these kind of things. So, um, you know, any a trans woman who has prostate cancer or a trans man who has ovarian cancer and screening for those kind of things, you really need a special clinic and special services, um, uh, gynecological, urological, who understand these things and don't perpetuate the stigma. So I think the toolkit will help with that, but I, I wanted to, to ask Asa, you know, I, I'm trying to think it's probably going to be based on the locale, the city, where you're at, where you live, but are there any other national resources uh, that offer some strategies for reaching out and um, kind of getting getting these folks to the table? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is an excellent question. I, I think that when um, when we're talking about health outcomes, and you know, especially in this example, for example, uh, these are, um, uh, I think the first was uh, a black um, trans, actually they both were black trans folk and thinking about the reality, which is that people are not engaged in healthcare a lot of the time. And they're not engaged in healthcare either because of real discrimination that they faced or um, you know, anticipated discrimination based on what, they, what their friends have seen, right? So people are just not coming in. You know, the first thing is that we're hoping to um, to educate clinicians, not just about like knowledge items, like, you know, what they need to know. I mean, I can tell you how you would approach these folks clinically, you know, but really you need, you need the person sitting in front of you, right? You need to develop that rapport. You need to develop that trust. And that's just never going to happen. If you're, if you've closed your mind, you've closed your heart to, um, to a group of people, right? Um, so, Yes, I mean, we definitely, I mean, have, um, we definitely have protocols about treating folks with prostates who have prostate cancer. We have protocols for treating people who have ovarian cancer. It's not that it's not the treatment of the issue. It's about getting the person engaged in care and that they're going to continue to come back. So were they even there to get screened in the first place? We're seeing folks who are coming in um, with health issues that ha that were just left to um, uh, get worse because they weren't there, you know, obviously any type of cancer, you need people there as early as possible if you want those good outcomes. And you're not going to get that if folks are waiting until they can barely walk out of their house, right? So, I mean, everything that's in the toolkit about, you know, uh, Im improving uh clinicians and other healthcare providers ability to communicate and um, and to establish trust and to listen to the concerns of their clients is going to improve all of these health outcomes. Yes, I mean, by the time, you know, you, you have a diagnosis and you're doing your, in, you know, interventions, whether it's chemotherapy or surgery, um, those, those are pretty standard, right? Um, but if the person's not there, you're not going to be able to do a thing. So maybe right. that's a roundabout way of saying, yes, this toolkit can absolutely um, address all of uh, these issues. Well, you know, Asa, I'll, I think that's such a great comment because it's, it's actually encouraging people not to focus on the population itself and saying, how do we reach this population if you make the center more accepting and more embracing and more warming, then you can kind of bring people in and then you get to deal with these protocols. It actually, I'm seeing this question or this comment from James Dillon, where they're really parsing out um, cultural competency um, and speak about how we're talking about something a little bit different with the attitudes, not of, only of the organization, but of the individual level staff members. And I think this is an important part to really talk about 
kind of the difference between cultural competency and cultural humility, which cultural competency traditionally used to focus on kind of almost borderline stereotypic looking at certain groups and saying, okay, you need to consider these kind of things with this group and you need to consider these kind of things with this group and you need to be aware of X, Y, and Z. I think cultural humility is kind of more of an umbrella. I don't think the two of them are mutually exclusive. I think they kind of, there's room at the table for both of them. There's kind of an overlap, almost like a Venn diagram, but where cultural humility is much more about encouraging not only healthcare providers, but all the staff, whether it's phlebotomist, medical assistant, front desk person, janitor, to kind of look at um, things and say, well, okay, I'm coming from a certain biased lens. I'm coming from a certain journey, whether it be through language, culture, geographic location, whatever. I have to sit back and recognize my own bias and be humble and sit back and say, I'm dealing with a person that hasn't shared my same journey. So I need to be open and just be receptive to listen to what they're telling me. And exactly what Asa was saying, if you do that, then you can embrace the protocols for gynecologic uh, cancers with the trans men or uh, prostate cancer with trans women. You can do all those things, but it, it involves you being not just culturally competent, but expressing a certain amount of cultural humility and taking yourself out of the equation and really being receptive to who that person is presenting in front of you. I also think the distinction of the terms also um, speaks to responsibility um, in terms of, you know, when I, when I think about the context of competency, you know, th there's a level of, and, and I get it and I understand it, but there's a level of kind of looking at an individual and saying, saying kind of, this is potentially what's wrong, you know, and, and that there's something that, that has to be fixed about the individual um, as opposed to how can I help you? How can I support you? And I think that's where the concepts of humility and safety come more so. And I don't, I'm not saying anything's absolutely wrong with competency in that way. I just think it's really important that we understand that distinction. And when we talk about, I think, humility and safety, it comes more from the perspective of like, what is my responsibility? How do I have to show up as a provider in a health system, you know, that potentially has uh, power, potentially in terms of decision-making power, financial power, um, political power to do differently and to recognize how I'm set up as a system and structure that may be causing harm or oppression to the people that I am trying to treat or work with within the system or as an individual. Um, and so I think, you know, the narratives become really important around doing this work um, and how we challenge um, the dominant narratives or the malignant narratives that are out there about people oftentimes in our communities that don't serve to really advance equity. Um, and that's part of the work I think that this toolkit can inspire. You know, it's again, beyond just the technical pieces of the work, it's how do we think, what are our mental models, you know, about ourselves and about society that completely undermine our ability to even see and listen to people in different ways and understand their experience fully. And I think the deep work of equity is challenging our own narratives and our own understanding um, in doing this work. Thank you. Thank you for that. There's one piece that I'd like to add into that, that system of thinking is the, the patient education. Often we're working with folks that don't realize I, I, have a, I have a pain, I have some illness in my body, but the ability to communicate that to a physician or to any caregiver is, is small. They can tell you where, but not what. And so each, for me, each encounter, each encounter where you're meeting with a, a client leaves some knowledge of body and what health actually looks like. Do we ever ask the question of how does it feel to be healthy? Do you understand what that means for you? If we can bring those two pieces together, the seeking not out of illness, but to maintain health, that to me is the win. We can address people in all kinds of ways if they feel worthy for the, the walk that we're trying to offer or that you all are trying to offer them into help. I'd like to spend some time on the questions in the box. So let's see what we got here. Benjamin, if you're there, I'm having trouble navigating the questions and I can't, I can't read that fast. Can you help out? I absolutely can. 
Hello, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yes. Great. So the first question asks, uh, do you have any thoughts on the toolkit expanding beyond cultural competency and humility and addressing structural competency as well, where providers can recognize and respond to the ways broader structural and systemic mechanisms contribute to disparities in LGBTQI health? I mean, sure, that's a lot of question there. Yeah. So <laughs> I yeah, can say ahead. that um, for the toolkit, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that there are links. So you can actually click on the link and find out, for example, issues of housing, employment, legal structure, you know. Um, so it, it is all there. Um, uh, so it starts off looking like a small toolkit. I mean, it's, but as you go in, you get to actually look at multiple different areas. Now, of course, in a training, you're not going to be able to um, address a lot of the issues that are kind of outside the parameters of that institution, but at least you have an awareness and you, at least you're able to impart that to the, the folks that you're training so that no one can... Um, you know, no one's going to be in this bubble where they're completely unaware of all of these other external factors that are um, that can impact the health of their um, their clients. So I think it's it is worthwhile to go through and and look at the fabulous links actually. Oh. <laughs> so thank you for putting all of those in there. Yeah, I would also encourage people to. I think every region is different, and I think part of the whole cultural humility. Uh, lesson that we all need to learn, even those of us who have worked on the toolkit or do this work every day and think that we have it down, is that we do tend to exist in our bubbles, whether it be ideologic bubble or a geographic bubble where we live. So someone that is living in, like I live in Atlanta, Georgia, but the context is going to be different if someone's in Wyoming or someone's in New York City or in you know, Birmingham, Alabama, like there are going to be different things with this. And one of the things that I, I keep coming back to in Atlanta that I've learned um, for good and for bad is that a lot of these decisions that are made that affect the housing, the education, the bigger structural things, the employment are, are dictated by politicians um, that get in there and may not have the information or are exhibiting a certain amount of bias because they wanna do what they wanna do. And it's not just the, the federal parts where we have to show up, but like the smaller local elections, the smaller local politicians can really have a huge impact on what's happening with your local community. So what I've seen be successful, at least in, I live in East Point, um, which is a, the, the Southern end of Atlanta, um, near the airport. And I think a, a lot of the different districts and counties there have elected some new officials, uh, both who are black and both who are same gender loving or of diverse sexual and gender orientations. And I think it's important. I think Kimberly had mentioned in her comment, particularly um, about black uh, trans folks and ovarian cancer is that representation matters because you need the advocates, but we need the advocates in the political spaces because a lot of times they drive the purse strings and they drive the priorities of the agendas. And if we don't voice our agendas, or if we don't get in there, um, people are still gonna be looking at us like, oh, we're just complaining about X, Y, and Z and feel like it's not important. So I think it's really important for us to, um, to, kind of, to kind of get involved in politics as much as, I mean, I can't stand politics. And we're sitting there having this, you know, having this Zoom conversation where Russia is attacking Ukraine right now and trying to take them over. And it's just, these are kind of the larger politics, but a lot more tangible things are happening at our local level. So the more we get involved, not just in the community-based organizations, but in the local political infrastructure, we can make those changes. We can actually exert some power over getting purse strings and getting some of these structural changes that we wanna see in effect happening on the local level. It may not be the broad kind of national change that we need, but you start small and then you can kind of build it up. Hi, everyone. I want to jump in because Henry Martin in the chat asks, and I think this really applies here, about 
um, recommendations for health information exchanges and community information exchanges to try to make these resources also be more culturally competent. And this, this is for us part of the structural and systemic issues that require the exertion of personal power on the systems that are in place. And so I think everything that David and Asa have, have said really applies here as well. But again, I come back to care. That, that can be a really exhausting role for anyone is, is um, trying to make sure that we all stay on track and stay ethically connected to what we're doing. So there has to be a community built for that and built around that level of support and, and using your voice in that way. But it is important, Benjamin, thank you. And then I have one final curiosity since, since you're all here, that two years ago when uh, we were kind of thrown for a loop or really thrown for a loop with COVID, I think a lot of the trainings, at least my experience around training was, was live training and, and virtual was a fallback. We do that when we don't have access in some other way. Over these two years, I think some of us have learned how to work in the virtual world. As things appear to be opening up in some ways for some folks, how do you think that this two years is going to affect how we look at training to begin with and how do we make the adjustment for that heart connection within this virtual world? How do we continue that? Well, I don't think things are ever going to go back to the way they were. I mean, and I'm sure we all agree with that. Um, what I've seen from my own experience is that a lot of institutions have realized that, oh, um, we can we can try and cram as many people onto a Zoom session to get this training done when we couldn't have done it, you know, we didn't have a physical space that's large enough. And I, I think as trainers, we have to make it really clear that you cannot you cannot do a workshop with 300 people <laughs> on Zoom because you it's just not effective. Um so you know, we've learned new skills to put put uh, to have rooms within Zoom so that, that you can have smaller groups. Um, I think we've learned a lot about how to prepare people before you get on the Zoom, certainly a lot more preparation um, with materials, uh, how to follow up. So yes, we're not going back. I think that when we started off, um, at least I wasn't, I can speak for myself, I wasn't very tech savvy. <laughs> you know, I was the one who was always getting the Oh, I'm on mute or disconnected, and um, and hopefully we've got past that. Um, you know, it can be challenging, but I also think there are some real positives. For example, the folks who never stood up and asked a question um, are now going on to chat and asking a question. And even if they don't want to ask out loud, maybe I'll just get that personal personal message and personal questions. So in some ways it's, there are a benefits, um, but I do miss the, the human kind of person to person, physical space connection. Um, I do, I agree in terms of, I think um, it, we're definitely not going back, but I, I do see a tremendous amount of opportunity. I've been in, engaged in a tremendous amount of training, um, both at AMA as well as CDC now. And I completely echo that, you know, there's a tendency to want to train as many people because we have so many people in the organization, but that it doesn't work that way. And we still have to keep to this, this small, the smaller models. Not only has there been the opportunity though to hear from voices that we don't typically hear from, as sitting, into the, sitting in those rooms and listening, it's also an opportunity kind of for the flip of the reverse. So I have had the opportunity to kind of engage with people when I do see that they're quiet. So that whole safety context that we talked about before um, and, and potential for harm and potential for conflict or re-traumatizing people or traumatizing folks, when I see people really quiet or silent, it is an opportunity to kind of dive in into the space and have a conversation with somebody um, or a group of people that you see some level of attention is rising up in a way that we really couldn't before. 
um, in terms of when you do completely in person. I think we need to have, I'm hoping what is gonna happen is that we begin to have more of a mix because I think there is an opportunity that happens with the virtual environment in being able to engage with more people, but smaller groups and breakouts as was mentioned. However, then taking that training to an in-person opportunity so that folks can also meet and engage with each other over time, especially in the context of an institution, because we can't, it's really hard to drive cultural change without that in, of an institution, without that interpersonal um, con connection and contact um, and interaction. Um, and it's, you know, the ability to be able to even see people and what they look like um, is, is really helpful in, in um, also driving and, and spurring change, you know, at, at an institution or anywhere, you know, that, that we are. So I think it's gonna end up being a, a mix of training. Um, we're gonna have to have a little bit more protections in place for people um, as they are in the online and virtual environment to help support mental health and safety as well. Aletha, I wanted to ask you, because I saw this question, and I don't know whether there's something with the AMA that you you may be privy to with this, but I'm seeing um, someone commented, I think there's Atticus who said, it's such important work, but are we doing kind of measuring of these yeah. outcomes and seeing, or if, you know, Asa can talk about this toolkit um, and kind of what are we doing on all these levels to kind of measure if some of this stuff has an impact um, whether qualitatively or quantitatively or in some other structural fashion? Yes, I mean, that's an important question. And I think that is our frontier now um, as it relates to doing equity and training work. And I, you know, I, I feel, you know, in the, I won't say the beginnings of doing this because training has been happening for years, um, but just in the equity context, right? It's kind of, we need to educate people. We need to get this knowledge out there. We need to put these skills forward. And we were less focused on kind of, these larger evaluation opportunities. And I think now there are more folks who have put trainings in place that are similar, that we have an opportunity to actually set up structures to do larger scale evaluations um, in ways that we haven't before. And we've been working with um, several um, entities you know, across the country who have been delivering training to start providing support and evaluation so that we can see what's happening and if, is this effective or not. I also think with, you know, and I, you know, want to hear more so from Asa, but with this particular toolkit, you know, there's an opportunity and I'm putting this out in the air to like, you know, work with a, an institution like as a whole, right? And in several institutions across the country to kind of implement and utilize this toolkit and set up, you know, a, an, an evaluation opportunity, um, you know, that just doesn't exist. And so I would love to be able to do that type of opportunity with a toolkit like this, because this is a very unique toolkit. Um, and it's one of the first of its kind. And so if there's ways that we can partner, and I think the partnerships piece is absolutely critical um, in driving this work forward, we can do that. And then just to speak to the regulatory pieces of it. And, you know, the reality is, is if um, healthcare does not have a greater level of accountability um, in terms of from the regulatory aspect, um, that there's not incentives for health systems um, to actually do equity work and to measure equity work, people are gonna move slowly. Like that's, we, we know that that's the case. And so we are working now through several efforts with certain commissions and other regulatory bodies. Um, that's the opportunity that we have as the AMA to um, consider um, how they can embed kind of adding metrics for evaluation and assessment, not just for training, but also just improvements within like quality and safety systems that will be, that will hold institutions with greater accountability. Everyone tends to tiptoe around that, but we are start, starting to push more in that direction um, and moving with some well-known you know, entities that people are very well aware of um, to, to really get those structures in place. I wanted to ask, is this, um, and I, I, I don't know whether uh, either Benjamin or Asa could answer this question, but are there, like supposing there's an organization or a group that wants to utilize the toolkit um, and be able to do these things, are there ways they can actually uh, give feedback, whether it be qualitative or quantitative? Is there some way, is this kind of, are we seeing this as kind of an evolving toolkit that's kind of fluid and starts to improve as time goes along or starts to add in different components as things change 
Um, what's the room for that or what is available for participants or people who want to utilize the toolkit to actually have some input? Because I think that's where it becomes a like a living, breathing thing that still is perpetuated and created and maintained by us. My understanding is the intent is that it is meant to be a living document. The actual structure for feedback to come through, um, I'm not clear on that. And I think Benjamin could probably answer that better, but it would be, it would be a loss not to have the toolkit and, and any of this information breathe. We, we all need to be a part of this. This seems like a really good start, but it is a start. That's, that's where we are with this. Benjamin, do you know how people can um, add to or, or add their voice to what we're doing here? Thank you, Dee. Yes, we have a feedback form built into the homepage of the toolkit expressly for that reason. This, as cultural competency and cultural humility is an aspiration and a growing process and practice, so is this toolkit. So we want it to change and reflect the, the most up-to-date language of our communities. Well, with that, um, I'm sure there are other questions in the chat box. Um, Benjamin, I'm gonna lean on you to share those, but before I step back, I'd love to thank all of you that have been on the panel today. It's really been an honor to sit here with you all and I appreciate your work over time. So uh, blessings and I will see you again. See, the love is mutual. The love is mutual. It's been an honor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No doubt. Just sit tight. I think Benjamin has other questions for you. No, this has been fantastic. You have all been delightful. And I'm going to just come on screen so that I am less of a am disembodied voice. Huh. Um, thank you so much for your time and your energy to all of our panelists and to our participants. This has been uh, just fantastic. I, I think that is plenty of information for everyone. I'm sure that we uh, have a lot to digest and to reflect on. Thank you all so much for your, um, well, and I wanna thank in particular our attendees for their robust participation in the conversation. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of your questions, um, but I hope that you continue to ask them and continue to challenge us. I've, we've, I've seen a lot of resources come through the, the chat box. I'm going to do my best to collect those and add them to the next update of our toolkit. Thank you so much. Any closing words from our distinguished guests? No, I just want to say it's been an honor to be on this. And thank you, Benjamin, um, Aletha, Asa, and Whitman Walker for uh, inviting me to be on this panel. I think this is just such vitally important work. Totally agree. And I'm very excited actually to share it out. We will definitely be using our vehicles um, and spaces at AMA to elevate and, and share it with the community at large. Yes, and likewise, it um, was an honor to, to uh, be on this panel and to uh, also to be involved in this process. It's really wonderful. Thank you all so much. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everybody.